Hello again doctors and welcome back to my channel. This video is going to wrap up all the info for the blood flukes. I'm going to be going over schistosomiasis. This will include the pathology, immunology, and pharmacology. Part 1 of this video will be linked in the eye as well as down in the description. So without further ado, grab some coffee, get comfortable, and let's get started. For the pathology of schistosomiasis, we're going to follow the same time order as their life cycle in humans. So starting at their route of entry, which is direct penetration of skin. The blood flukes can cause what's called swimmer's itch, which occurs hours to days post-exposure to contaminated fresh water. It's raised puretic blisters at the site of circaria penetration. Now this usually self-resolves and can actually go unnoticed by the patient. As we've gone over, after entry, they migrate to the portal system to mature, which takes four to six weeks as they become male or female and pair. So in terms of clinical presentation, the patients are initially asymptomatic until those paired adults migrate to the veins of the GIT or bladder to lay eggs. That's when symptoms typically present. And there are really two categories of syndromes for schistosomiasis, acute and chronic. And it's based on time of onset of symptoms post egg laying. And we're not talking an egg or dozens of eggs. We're talking upwards of a thousand eggs per day per worm pair. And these eggs are being released within the lumen of veins, which of course contain flowing blood. So the eggs can actually get swept into the bloodstream, gaining access to systemic circulation. When this initially occurs, it can cause a systemic serum sickness-like reaction. And this is acute schistosomiasis. It occurs hours to days post-onset of egg laying. Acute schistosomiasis is also called katayama or snail fever, or bilharzia, and it's basically an immune response to foreign antigens in the blood. In this case, the eggs being laid in the veins of the GIT or bladder, some of which embolize and circulate. True serum sickness is a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, which is when our circulating antibodies, namely IgM and IgG, bind to the surface of antigens that are soluble in blood. This causes immune complex formation, which in excess, when not properly cleared by macrophages, deposit in small blood vessels, joints, and the glomeruli of the kidney. In turn, this causes inflammation at the sites of deposition. Now, the actual pathogenesis of Katayama is unknown, but it's thought to be similar to serum sickness, and you get this nonspecific set of symptoms. The first of which, fever, myalgia, malaise, are just pro-inflammatory. It tells you there's probably an active immune process happening. Next is shortness of breath and dry cough, and here's our involvement of the fourth system, the lung. And that's due to the deposition of immune complexes in the microvasculature of the alveoli and presents with transient infiltrates on x-ray due to the inflammation caused by the deposits. Most of the flukes can cause hepatomegaly because they either mature or colonize it. And you'll see in my example question at the end how this symptom helps narrow down to a schistosome. The other symptoms that point to them is the frank blood in either urine or stool. Now, katayama can be treated if it's caught, but it does self-resolve. So if left untreated, patients are at risk of developing chronic schistosomiasis, taking months to years post-infection to become symptomatic. And the effects of chronic schistosomiasis can be split up into two categories, local and systemic. And we're going to start off with the local effects, and the immune response there, meaning in the bladder or the GIT, is granulomatous. And this has to do with those eggs that are being laid. They're being deposited in the lumen of the veins of the GIT or bladder. But how do they get from the lumen of the veins, a closed circuit, out of the body? Well, they need to traverse tissue in order to do this. The blood flukes have a couple ways of doing this. The ones that have spines use them to cut their way through. And all of them also release proteolytic enzymes to help digest tissue. This allows them to cut their way through the muscular walls of the GIT or bladder to make their way into the lumen and out of the body. The trauma to the tissues is also what causes the occult bleeding, leading to hematochesia or hematuria. It's also what leads us to the local granulomatous reaction, because some of the eggs on their way out of the body get stuck in some of the tissue layers. The local immune cells in that area recognize the eggs as foreign and over time form a granuloma around clusters of eggs. And I'll do a whole video on granulomas, but for now I'm just going to point out two important components of the structure, 
here and here. These purple cells are called histiocytes, and they are just specialized macrophages that have been under the stimulation of inflammatory cytokines like interferon gamma and TNF for a prolonged period of time. So they become these specialized killing machines. And secondly, this yellow patchwork design is collagen fibers, and that was laid down by fibroblasts. And the cytokine to remember for that is TGF-beta. TGF-beta is an excellent cytokine to remember for step because it has two important roles that pertain to two highly testable topics. And luckily we have a mnemonic for them both. The first is that it stands for the granuloma former. TGF-beta is released by local immune cells and it calls immature fibroblasts to the area and tells them to lay down collagen. And that fibrotic cap is really what forms the wall of a granuloma. And the second important role for TGF-beta is that it is the granddaddy of fibrosis for the same reason. It has the ability to call immature fibroblasts to a site and tell them to lay down collagen. So you can see here on this histopath slide, wherever schistosomes eggs end up, they trigger granuloma formation and they just chill there in the center. Because you have these thousands of eggs being laid per day, causing damage and getting lodged, you have these episodes of acute inflammation being superimposed on chronic inflammation. Acute takes two weeks to become chronic and granuloma formation takes even longer, but these eggs are being laid every single day. So these repeated inflammatory events ultimately lead to the pathological presentation of chronic gistosomiasis, where the effects are organ-specific. In the GIT for Mansonia and Japonicum, the patient will present with these episodes of chronic bloody diarrhea, bloating, and abdominal cramping. And for hematobium, it will be chronic episodes of painless bloody urine and flank or pelvic pain. Now, this is the information that's typically already given to you in a vignette on step and the question will pertain to the course and complications, which again are organ-specific. For the GIT treatment nodes, the major complications are the colonic or rectal obstructions, and the patient will present with an acute abdomen. However, much more high yield are the chronic complications of hematobium, the first one being bladder calcification and its sequelae. And again, this is due to that repeated damage caused by the flukes traversing the tissue on their way out of the body. It leads to thickening of the tissue and ultimately dystrophic calcification, typically in the dome of the bladder, seen with the clear arrow. This will lead to narrowing of the vesicle ureter junction, ultimately calcifying the ureter as well, seen in the solid arrows. These factors lead to urine stasis, ultimately raising the hydrostatic pressure in the postrenal space, and leading to the sequelae of hydronephrosis and ultimate renal failure. Now that we've gone over the local granulomatous effects for the flukes, we can focus on these systemic effects for chronic schistosomiasis, which are fibrotic, mainly in the liver. And this is due to the portal venous system, which shunts blood from the GIT to the liver before it enters back into the major systemic venous circulation. So because Mansonia and Japonicum reside in the mesenteric veins of the GIT, some of them can actually get backwashed into the venules of the liver via the portal system. And this causes a reaction which is referred to as hepatic pipe stem fibrosis. This is how it will look on gross image, with the whitened areas around the venules being your areas of fibrosis. Now it's also sometimes referred to as periportal fibrosis, because remember the eggs are in the venules and they're being deposited in the periportal space, and the fibrotic reaction is occurring around them, giving this appearance which is referred to as pipe stem fibrosis. And just another friendly reminder that this fibrotic reaction is due in large part to the release of the cytokine TGF-beta, the granddaddy of fibrosis. Now, all acute episodes in the liver share the same course and complications, being chronic cirrhosis, the major complication of which is portal hypertension. Now that we've gone over both the local and systemic effects of chronic schistosomiasis, we've gone over everything that the species share. And now we are going to focus on the long-term side effects of one fluke in particular, and that is S. hematobium, the bladder fluke. Now we've gone over the fact that he can cause bladder calcification and its complications of hydronephrosis and renal failure. However, their favorite topic to test on any fluke is the link between schistosoma hematobium and transitional cell carcinoma. So the number one risk factor for any fluke, aka the number one most decimal topic for any fluke, is that S-hematobium 
in the chronic state markedly increases the patient's risk for developing urothelial carcinoma. Bladder cancer is one of those obscure topics they love to test on because it only has a few known causes. 80% of them are environmental or occupational. So people that are exposed to some sort of carcinogen like hairdressers, painters, leather workers, rubber workers are at risk. And the other two known risk factors are the S's, smoking and schistosoma hematobium. So environmental factors, cigarette smoking, and schistosomes. The clinical presentation for urothelioma is a lot like our bladder fluke in that it is painless bloody urine. Painless bloody urine is more commonly bladder cancer than it is renal cancer. The difference here between a fluke infection and urothelioma would be the systemic fatigue, cachexia, anorexia, and conjunctival pallor. Diagnostic gold standard would be cytoscopy with biopsy, where for the squamous cell morphology, you would see keratin pearls invading the bladder wall. And this is the second most common morphology for carcinomas of the bladder. The complications of urothelioma are actually the exact same as the bladder fluke, being hydroureter, hydronephrosis, and ultimately chronic renal failure. The difference here is the risk of metastases. And the most common sites of spread, according to NCBI, are the lymph nodes, bone, lung, and liver. So in terms of a question on step, this information in the box is typically what's already given to you in a vignette, the clinical presentation and the findings from the investigation. So the question will either be about a risk factor, smoking, or in our case, just assumes, or the question will be about a complication or spread of the cancer. And now on to the pharmacology. The one and only drug we need to know for the blood flukes is praziquanto. And the nice thing about it is that the mechanism is actually unknown, so we don't need to worry about it. What they do know is that it's metabolized through CYP3A4, so you can't give it in conjunction with any known CYP3A4 inhibitors like azoles and phenytoin. The major uses of praziquanto are for flatworms. In fact, the only fluke it won't work on is the fasciolas. It can also be used for cystodal infections, so tapeworms, including neurocystis sarcosis with tinea soleum and hiatid disease with echinococcus granulosis and multilocularis. And that is it for the discussion portion of this video. Next up is a URL style MCQ. If you don't want to stick around for that, make sure you give this video a huge thumbs up before you leave. And if you are going to stick around, make sure you pause the video once I put the question up, because after 10 seconds, I'm just going to jump into the explanation. Okay, so the first symptom that should stand out in the first few lines is that bloody urine because it states that he's otherwise healthy and the next few lines are all of the negative symptoms. The other major clue is that mildly elevated renal values and the most obvious, the urine microscopy where they found the egg of schistosoma hematobium making the answer D, transitional cell carcinoma. Now this was obvious because this video is on the blood flukes, however, now I'm going to take you through this question and show you how the rest of the answer options can be ruled out even if you're not given microscopy of the egg. Option A is a great distractor because the flukes do mature in the liver and they can cause that hepatic pipe stem fibrosis. However, they are not associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. The major association there is with hepatitis B and C, which we can rule out because this guy has no history of drug abuse or clinical history of transfusion. He's also a reporter, not a farmer, and he has no known contact with peanuts and crops, which would be a risk factor for aflatoxin, which is produced by the fungal species Aspergillus flavus. Option B is another great distractor because although the bladder flu can cause hydronephrosis and chronic renal failure, it's not associated with renal cell carcinoma, which actually has no known infectious causes. The major associations to know for RCC are genetic and environmental, and the number one being von hippel lindau disease. Option C, dilated cardiomyopathy, has many infectious causes, the major one being viral Coxsackie B, which is part of Pacorna viridae, a family of non-enveloped, linear, positive-sense, single-stranded RNA viruses. Secondly, a fellow parasitic cause is Trypanosoma cruci, with the development of Chagas disease. And finally, Strep pyogenes, a gram-positive bacterium, can cause dilated cardiomyopathy as a complication of rheumatic fever. Now, all of these in option C can be ruled out because none of them in the stages of dilated cardiomyopathy would cause either bloody urine or hepatomegaly. And finally, for E, corpomenal is sort of a throwaway and is actually associated with the lung fluke, Paragonemus westermanni, who's in my next video, 
but corpulmonol is incorrect for the same reasons as it would not cause bloody urine or hepatomegaly and it would certainly present with either shortness of breath or cough which were denied by this patient okay doctor and that is it for schistosomiasis i apologize for my voice in this video i have been under the weather in this new year I do hope you found the video helpful, and if you did, make sure you smash that huge thumbs up just down below. Stay tuned to my channel for more videos like these. Best of luck studying, and I, of course, will see you on the next one. Let's go. I said hold up, hold up for a minute. I said hold up, hold up for a minute. Hold up for a minute.